Hello everyone, I'm really, really excited to be here. I think it is of, of great importance to, uh, uh, to conduct consciousness studies from a multidisciplinary and uh, dialogical conversational uh, approach. Now my, ba my background is the social sciences and the humanities, so of course I will use the term consciousness in a very different way and I hope that's okay. And I hope that I will be clear in my use of the term consciousness. Uh, the title of my talk, which I hope will be quite short, is the encounter with non-human animals as possibility for transformation. So uh, I'm a PhD student uh, at Concordia in religious studies. And my approach to religious traditions and culture is to look for, I will mention this later on again, to look for resources for liberatory politics because I, I, I'm truly convinced that they're out there, these resources. So the way I will speak about uh, human consciousness rather that way in connection to animal consciousness, non-human animal consciousness, is an integrated, relational, and embodied consciousness that is inherently ethical, an ethical category that enables the agent to appropriately position herself to reality in life-affirming ways. In other words, I agree with Olivinas on that one, that ethics is first philosophy. Human consciousness becomes important only in relation to the other. Precisely because other animals are consciousness, our ethical interaction with them is full of potential for transformation in us, and I think positive, uh, positive change is ultimately what this con uh, uh, conversation is about. So uh, my focus here on my understanding of consciousness is, is uh, inherently intersubjective. So when I enter uh, an, an, uh, an encounter with a non-human animal, I anticipate and engage with this non-human animal as minded and as another subject. Uh, let me begin by sharing an experience of an encounter with a pig on her way to the slaughterhouse and how this experience has shaped my, uh, shaped my activism and my overall approach to animal consciousness. On the way out of Toronto at a truck stop, my friend and I uh, saw a truckload full of pigs and I was quite reluctant to go and approach this truck I was afraid about, uh, of what I would see, even though I was vegan then and I knew the reality behind uh, animal agribusiness and the flesh industry. But I did. I, I pulled myself together. I, I, I wanted to go take pictures and uh, bear witness to the suffering of these, of these beings. So when I approached the truck, I noticed I heard heavy, heavy breathing. At first I thought, is this, uh, what is this, is this? exhaustion, is this a heat stroke? When I came closer and looked into the eye through the metal grill and looked into the eyes on the face of this pig, she was, I, I'm not sure whether she was a, a girl or, or a boy, I could see her, her eyes wide, wide open. And I realized when I looked into her face that she was hyperventilating. This was just such a, I had a gut reaction right there because I could see, I could feel that this non-human animal, this being, is afraid. It's, 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 she's terrified. She's terrified. When I touched her face, I actually reached out and, and touched her face. And I talked to her in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a low voice and I tried to be as gentle as I could. I, I noticed that she actually calmed down. Her breathing came slower and slower, slowed down. So I realized in this moment that there was something going on between us there. Um, I definitely felt a transformation in me. I knew I was not, that there was meaning to what I was doing as a, as a vegan activist and it strengthened my commitment to, to change, to, to, to helping animals. Now, it sounds as if this was all about me because I really don't know what this encounter did for this victim, for this pig. Because we know that there's no happy ending to this. The truck continued on its way to the slaughterhouse. But I'd like to mention that uh, the situation continued. All of a sudden I heard a voice. The trucker yelled at me, get away from the hogs, they'll bite your hands off. What, I replied. 
These pigs are terrified. Just look at them. They're not aggressive, they're scared. They're reaching out for help. Listen, lady, he had stopped yelling by then. I just do not want anybody get hurt. This man was driving about 70 sentient and aware beings to their deaths and could still claim he did not want anybody to be hurt. He was obviously in full denial of reality. Empathy studies, uh, as an activist, I feel the responsibility to learn from, from other disciplines as much as possible, and including cognitive science and empathy studies. And empathy studies makes a lot of the fact that when we perceive other minds, I hope I get this right, when we perceive other minds, minded beings, minded creatures, we use very different neurobiological mechanisms than in the perception of inanimate things. And the very fact that non-human animals can communicate with us and do communicate with us, reach out to us, engage with us, makes us already a participant right then and there in intersubjective consciousness. There is no way out of this for those who want to reduce the non-human animal to an object and claim that this move does not have any negative or impoverishing uh, effect on him or her. Objectification of the, of the animal in front of us means a denial of our own feelings, a denial of who and what we are as human animals that coexist with other animals. Now, what many guardians of companion animals already know, other animals respond with insight to the impulses and feelings of those of their own species and other species. Animals actually do show empathy for humans. Pigs, dogs, and many other species participate in this way with intersubjective consciousness with humans. So in this way, I understand intersubjective consciousness as an activity, in part, as an activity. We simply cannot deny that non-human animals have strong emotive effects on the human person. No inanimate object could elicit such direct emotional response in us. And if this is not objective, uh, excuse me, objective enough for you, uh, I wonder why this approach of the engaged scientist uh, is acceptable uh, with regard to studying qualities or, or the different quality of consciousness in very young humans. Uh, in, in the studies of, of, of infant consciousness, for example, where the scientist will engage and communicate with the human animal, young human animal, to study consciousness. So um, I definitely believe that, um, uh, according to philosopher, uh, a German philosopher, Lipp, that empathy is a precondition for any kind of study of consciousness. I, I, I buy that. I, I find that really compelling as idea. I'd like to make uh, uh, the point also that I know from conversations with former slaughterhouse workers about the emotional toll of killing other beings, sentient beings. Their screams, their face expressions of terror and suffering at the ends of their lives on the kill floor or the stick pit uh, uh, haunts these workers in their sleep and they turn to alcohol to forget this kind of, of reality and to forget these experiences. None of these uh, experiences could be felt by these workers if uh, it was about uh, perceiving sounds of falling bricks or, uh, uh, or, or, or any other kinds of, of, of stimuli that are not directly attached to the expression of other sentient beings. And there are many studies now and it's extremely important because slaughterhouse workers are definitely also victims of our ways of, of consuming other, other sentient beings. We're actually consuming their mental health and their spirits as well. So therefore I believe that one goal of activism, outreach work and humane education, there are many other forms of, of, of uh, compassionate activism, is to help create the conditions that make empathetic interaction with other animals possible at all. Empathy, as I said, is the primary basis for even recognizing other minded beings. When I was standing there at the uh, in, uh, in front of this truck and engaging with this pig, I was in a privileged situation. 
I have the free possibility to engage with this pig and to feel my empathy. This trucker, this is a class issue also, did not have the choice to feel this empathetic connection to this other sentient being. And I could see in his face, he was not okay, but he had no choice. Unfortunately, I did not, I could not ask him why he was doing this line of work, but he definitely felt it was a necessity. It's not my job right now to question the, uh, uh, his um, interpretation of the situation. So in my activism, I seek to break through cultural conditioning and bodily disciplining that we undergo in society that literally forces us to deny what we know already deep down, that other animals feel joy and that they're suffering. And as children, we tend to naturally encounter other animals, there are studies being done as well, as conscious fellow beings, and we relate to them as equal. But in time, we're we are trained to consider this childish fancy. Grow up, kid. Grow up, kid. We often hear. So we are thus cut off from our spontaneous and natural tendency to bond with them. And growing up, we're being disciplined to turn away from the faces of the animals and to objectify them. And this is against our nature. We know that humans have evolved with other animals. We are wired to connect and engage with other animals in many ways. So the ideal of civilization in itself is profoundly repressive and the denial of our own animality that we share as embodied, con uh, as embodied consciousness with other animals. Uh, and here I draw from the insights of the Frankfurt School, uh, which has uh, definitely influenced my political views in general, uh, my cultural critique, uh, critiques of, of, of um, the ideology of civilization and progress. Now, it's important to realize, in other words, that the well-being of non-humans and humans is closely connected. Allowing our human intersubjective and emotional connections with non-human animals is necessary for our mental health. The practice of empathy does not only open our eyes to the fullness of reality on our planet as one that is full of life, but it also heals us and allows us to grow and transform our relationship with ourselves as human animals, our self-understanding, and the meanings in our life. So as I mentioned, I'm doing my PhD in the philosophy and history of religion. And my approach, again, uh, as I mentioned, in the study of religion is to focus on the resources religious thought and practice can offer for liberatory politics. And now we know from scientific study that humans are hardwired to bond with non-human animals. This is uh, uh, something uh, that uh, a lot of religious narrative completely uh, uh, ignores, right? Human exceptionalism is certainly part of the religious narrative okay? and has been criticized by Anne Wright's activists, of course. But what I find interesting is the ways in which the study of religious language reflects uh, quite a lot of important truths about human longing, human hopes, human fears, and I'd like to focus on two. Uh, one important truth uh, that the study of religious practice and, and language in particular uh, uh, reflects is our yearning for the non-human. It reflects a human longing for expansion of consciousness, to transcend the very limited self and isolated self, and to grasp an experience of uh, uh, and grasp and to experience a fuller and more meaningful reality. Um, now, tragically in practice, humans tend to ignore the reality that is right there in front of their face. They will speculate about gods, project all kinds of, of, of desires, they uh, speculate about spirits and imagine, uh, imagine angels. Now, when, for example, um, and all of this can be empowering, all of this can be empowering and I have seen this happening, but I'm going somewhere else here in my argument. So uh, when I, for example, and this happens to me quite often, when someone tells, uh, says to me in a conversation, I wonder if we're the only intelligence in the whole universe. I wonder if there are aliens. I truly want to tell them, open your eyes. You're surrounded by awe-inspiring minded beings everywhere. Forget your aliens and go volunteer in an animal rescue. 
And this longing for aliens is just a historical and a cultural extension of what has come before, which is a longing for the non-human to connect to something other than us. Some would argue something bigger than us, but here I'm just arguing that we want to go beyond human drama. And um, <clears throat> our denial of our embeddedness in a web of conscious life has impoverished our world and has led to the systematic torture of other animals. And the hope is to stop speculating and daydreaming and to be actually receptive of reality. And this is something that religious thinkers of all traditions I could think of struggle with. They're very, very aware of this risk. And this is why I'm particularly interested in religious models of ethical development. And I was referring actually to the risk of being indulged right, in, in, in the otherworldly. This is definitely a risk, because there's an ethical dimension to, to religious thought. So as I said, uh, there are religious egomaniacs, but religions always have also offered a language to talk about a very important second human truth. We're selfish, angry, we're stuck in our mechanisms of projecting our needs and desires and ideas on the other, any other, human and non-human. Not to forget, we're scared to death about everything, <laughs> more or less, right? Perpetually anxious. And this is where meditation practice can come in, right, also. Uh, but I'd like to get somewhere else here that um, religions show us that deep down we know this, we know this. We may try to forget this, that we're finite, that we're extremely imperfect, but deep down we know it. So in other words, our appraisal of what actually happens before our eyes is clouded by our own concerns and anxieties. And a lot of uh, different religious practices, including meditation, um, have been designed to actually change uh, and transform uh, your perception and make it more true to reality. So one interpretation of religious ethics is that ethical consciousness is about realizing who you are in relation to others and about positioning yourself in an appropriate relationship to, what's happen to what happens outside of you. Facts and values, let's not forget, in religious thought typically are closely intertwined. <clears throat> So religious ethics in general assume that the human ordinary state of consciousness is distorted and disoriented by deeply unconscious selfish emotions. And it's fascinating how the recent, uh, recent literature of psychology uh, and also post-Freudian um, psychoanalysis really works together with certain religious concepts and, and ideas to, to produce better accounts of, of, of these problems. So um, uh, religions are uh, given an account of, of, of human suffering and, and limitedness. Humans are trapped by samsaric clinging, we're stuck in our fallen state, in endless paradox, restless and, uh, and anxiety. And in other words, human consciousness starts off as narrow and is in need of expansion. Now in psychology of religion, this understanding might be framed thus that until the self has undergone a profound spiritual transformation, the self is not capable of seeing, understanding, and reasoning correctly. And I definitely see a chance here to work with these uh, human truths. Now I'd like to turn um, more specifically to uh, 20th uh, century religious thought that dealt with the Holocaust, the realities of the Holocaust, and that realized the terror of ideological doctrine and the idol of the abstract idea. And again, the risk of indulging in the otherworldly as escape from personal experience in the here and now, and as an escape from personal responsibility that we just cannot escape. There's no way around it, because we're already always uh, in, in, uh, in engagement, in interaction with others. Now, these important thinkers and activists put into focus the concrete other as source for true transformation of consciousness. 
So especially from Jewish uh, thinkers such as Buber, Rosenzweig, and Levinas, but also Dietrich Bonhoeffer has, has had uh, an influence on my thought here, that we learn that consciousness is possible only through the encounter with the other, and that this encounter opens up the conditions of possibility for change in us and in growth. What Jewish philosopher Hans Jonas, for example, says that anthropomorphism is the realization of similar structures in the non-human species and that it is a skill and a practice. Or when Levinas says that ethics is first philosophy, they make the point that what the other is in principle, metaphysically, or in essence, is of no importance. Of true importance is our response to the call, to the face, or to the cries of the other. We are called upon to go into the encounter with others, always already anticipating and open to an agent who is as vulnerable, as complex, and as conscious and feeling as we are. It is true that these thinkers still operate in a speciesist worldview, especially within us sometimes, it really gives me a headache. Uh, and, uh, and, but still, this yearning, this need and the true possibility for ethical relationships to non-humans is existence, and I can see traces everywhere in, in these philosophies, and they're quite compelling. Now, with, rega with regard to activism and action on the ground, I see activists in, in, in all major religions, including Muslims, uh, especially Jews that I'm actually uh, studying, and Christians that take action with this in mind and with this in, uh, as their background. So it is time to realize that the denial of non-human consciousness makes for an unhealthy, not to say completely insane and impoverished worldview. It is spiritually deadening, deadening and self-destructive and a full realization of animal consciousness at the suicidal level will therefore accomplish, but will also probably go hand in hand with, a true cultural revolution with radical consequences and possibilities. And I'm open for questions. Yes, thank you. So, imagine a world 50 years into the future where the meat industry has become unsustainable. Uh, and the meat industry it. is unsustainable. Yeah, so they phase it out, and in 50 years, it's been replaced by the insect industry, where they're, I guess, growing and harvesting insects for human consumption, protein, whatever. Would, do you think you or other people would feel as empathic towards insects as food, as toward that industry, as opposed to being able to look into the eyes of the pig? Right, you're onto something here, of course. As I was not uh, inventing these ideas, but actually working with what I had with uh, respect to the traditions I'm working with, the religious traditions, of course the focus is, in this context, on those non-human animals that we're torturing right now, they're domesticated, and that we are already in a relationship with them. So I think that the way the situation is now, this is a quite challenging and empowering uh, view to have. Uh, uh, in pragmatic way, uh, terms, I would say, let's, let us worry about insects later when the time comes. On the other hand, I will not step on an insect if I can avoid it, absolutely. Would you support that transition if that were to be a reality to happen in the future, for example? No. No. I would not. And it's not necessary. I should have... Actually, I should have emphasized this. Yes, we're very, very. We can live very healthy and fulfilling lives on a plant-based diet. Um, there have been human communities throughout history that have been able to. I'm not saying that every uh, that every culture has, but uh, the way uh, uh, our consumption patterns we have today, uh, I don't even have words for it. It's not natural. It's it's self-destructive. Right? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Do uh, you think so far, being so far removed from the original, I guess, animal, as opposed to the package product you buy at grocery store, has increased that gap of ignorance or they're more willing to overlook? Because chicken nuggets don't look like a chicken, so. Is this a comment? Because well, it's very I'm true. Like, is, do you, would you think that would be the case, being so far removed? So education could fill in the gaps and lead, I guess, society towards more vegetarian or vegan path or that doesn't really matter. 
Well, there are at least two aspects to this. Um, one is my empathy to the non-human animal that has been killed. And uh, in my activism, I actually encourage people to come and volunteer in, 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 in animal farmed animal rescues. They will find that turkeys, for example, will be very curious to get to know you. They come towards you, they know their names, uh, that pigs are playful even uh, when they're quite old, that chickens uh, uh, communicate once they overcome their shyness. Uh, but then there's this other aspect, the suffering and the class issues surrounding the flesh industry and the human beings that are being harmed in the process. There, I mean, uh, I don't know the statistics, but just think of suicide. Killing all day will kill you, spiritually, mentally. This is an exploitation of a global level that, uh, that victimizes everyone involved. Yeah. way of thinking about animals, because like he had mentioned, eating meat at your home from a grocery store is very different than doing the killing yourself. Do you think people, people just physically lack something in their brain to have empathy for animals, or do you think a conversation can truly change their, their view on things? The religious activists that I have spoken to and that have inspired me very much, um, especially during my recent stay uh, in, in Israel, would say, yes, everyone has the capacity, and um, those uh, who have difficulty, their practices such as prayer, to, uh, uh, to ask for grace, this step, is or that already means you're already there almost. Um, me personally, I have not encountered anyone who was, com a lot of people that are in complete denial, but it's a painful denial. They're denying a part of themselves, and they're denying what they know, and they're denying even what they see. So they're, 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 that's crazy making. And this goes in line with our conditioning, right, at a cultural level, to force us to turn away, to turn away, and to stop trusting our own, our own perception and emotions. Uh, right, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so, empathy. Okay. Do you think empathy is something that has, that has kind of finite capacity within a given amount of time? For example, if a person has a little like empathy or compassion towards a certain amount of individuals in a day, they can arrive at the end of the day and feel like, oh, I'm tired, I want to take care of myself right now. So, what if, so first of all, do you think it's a finite thing? And what are I'm not sure I can fully answer your question. However, are you referring to compassion fatigue, right? Yeah. Usually my approach is, I'm, I'm, I'm really a new fan of the whole field of empathy studies. Empathy can be conceptualized in many different ways. It's a technical term, but of course it also has a history and, uh, and an etymology. But what I find fascinating about, uh, or very helpful, uh, 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 conceptualizing the encounter as one of empathy rather than compassion means that empathy has more connotation of, of justice, equality, and respect. When you're in a situation that you actually have to have compassion for the victim, such as on the kill floor, it's too late. The slaughterhouse worker is not in the position to actually have the privilege to develop compassion, or he just walks out. Empathy as an, as an approach starts right off from the very beginning, where we are in touch with, with uh, what we feel, what we know, uh, and uh, in relationship and in connection with the outside, the concrete other. I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Uh, I operate more, uh, but that's my approach. Yes. Of course, a compassion is very important, 
but uh, I find empathy uh, is a helpful term, especially now that we're actually studying, for example, the many, many, many components of, of empathy, right? From, from affective contagions to, uh, to affective and, and active empathy to sympathy. Uh, uh, and, and, and the great difference there is between, uh, for example, emotional distress caused by the sight of the suffering of others. For example, when we see the images of, of let's say, animals that are being skinned alive, uh, sometimes this image will cause us so much suffering that it's again all about our suffering. And we are not in a position to actually even engage with the thought of what this animal is going through. So I think there's a real, real potential in studying empathy further. And there have been so many studies including empathy in rats, empathy in mice. Uh, I'm more interested in rats. Uh, but there are many other animals, dogs, of course, and it has been proven that they empathize with humans, right? And empathy, uh, 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 the question whether or not some, uh, an animal or, or a human actually shows empathy the, uh, in terms of the, uh, affective contagion uh, is, is uh, determined uh, or predicated upon uh, about relationship rather than species. So based on how well uh, uh, one knows the other. Do I have time for one more question? Well, I, I think we're going to open it up for just a group discussion, so there'll be more questions. Perfect. And uh, right. just a quick comment from the back. Yeah, if people are asking questions from the back, then uh, if they could use the mic, that would be great. But uh, I think if um, Steve Harnack wants to s sit at the front table again, perhaps, and then I think Derek has a question right away, and we can just keep the discussion.